I'm John Prangnell. Welcome to the 14th uh, Jay Hall Lecture from the School of Social Science. Jay retired, I think, if I remember right, in 2006. So this should be our 15th Hall Lecture, but obviously we missed one last year. So uh, welcome to the 14th Hall Lecture. Uh, it's sponsored by Everick Heritage and we have uh, Richard and Tim sitting right here behind Jay and Alice. So thank you guys for your uh, sponsorship of this. And I'd like to uh, acknowledge, uh, do an acknowledgement of country. The University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands upon which we meet. We pay our respects to ancestors and descendants who contribute cultural and spiritual connections to country and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I also have to do some uh, housekeeping before I introduce our, our speaker. Fire escapes are at both sides of the stage and out the back. We've got our own special one just here, so in case, you know, so you'll have to fight us to get through to that one. The toilets are in the same directions, they're out the back or to that side there. And just to let you know, there will be photos being taken during today, tonight's uh, event. Uh, Julia will be at the back, so you, the back of your heads will be in photographs. So, let's say a little bit about Jay. I've known Jay since 1986, when I first started here. And he mentored me through many a strange and uh, exciting uh, research events, including my PhD, so thank you, Jay. Uh, Jay founded archaeology at this university. He came here, oh God, my memory, 1976. Yeah, good, thank you, Jay. 1976. And established archaeology and for many years was the only archaeologist in the school. Uh, he was later joined by Harry Laurendos, but it's really Jay's uh, pioneering endeavours that got archaeology off the ground in this university and much of what we have today we owe to Jay and his foundation. So thank you, Jay. I now want to introduce... Sorry. I've done it. That's at the end. No, I've got, I'm, 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 it's under control. <laughs> okay. I want to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Ian Lilly is Professor Emeritus in the UQ School of Social Science. He's also the invited inaugural inaugural Willem Willems Chair of Contemporary Issues in Archaeological Heritage Management at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And he's worked in Australasian and Indo-Pacific archaeology and heritage for over 40 years, uh, which began with beginning his research career under Jay's supervision. Ian is a fellow and immediate past international secretary and vice president of the Australian Academy of Humanities, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of London, a member of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. He served, he served three consecutive terms as president of the Australian Archaeological Association, was secretary of the World Archaeological Congress, and is a past secretary general of the Indo-Pacific Prehistory Association. There's others, that's enough. He's an overachiever. That's basically what this is saying. So I'm going to hand you over to Ian. No, oh, sorry. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, John, for your warm welcome to Jay and Alice for making it through the, the storms on the, all the way down from the peninsula. Executive Dean Heather Zwicker and Deputy Dean Greg Marston who's actually responsible for my, my emeritus professorship. So thank you again, Greg. Um, and this head of school, Linda Cheshire, who's I know here somewhere, I can't quite, there she is, waving to me, thank you. Uh, and all my friends and 
uh, colleagues who've managed to join us today. It's really great to see you all, especially in this weather. I'd like to add personally to the university's acknowledgement of country, paying my respects to the traditional owners of all UQ localities, and there's a lot of them, uh, and all the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people that I've worked with for many years and have called my friends. And thinking of lifelong friends, Everick, Richard and Ev and Tim, I've known a very long time, and I'm really grateful for their help here, but also other uh, very generous assistance that they've given to us at the university over a long time. Uh, and I hope that will continue fruitfully into the future. So thank you, guys. Um, please forgive me if I read this. I don't normally read my lectures, but I'm very prone to getting sidetracked by anecdotes. So um, I'll read. It's an extraordinary privilege for me to be speaking in Jay's honour. As many of you know, I worked closely with him for some years from the time he arrived here at UQ in 1976, and I've benefited enormously from his guidance and friendship throughout, guidance and friendship throughout my career. He got me started in Australian archaeology, first digging at the Prickly Bush site, just down the road, in fact, from here, on the edge of the St Lucia Golf Course, so called because he had to crawl through a Bougainvillea bush to get to the site. Nothing was easy in those days. He also kicked off my many years of research in Papua New Guinea by volunteering me to assist uh, Jim Specht on the Australian Museum project that first in, uh, demonstrated Pleistocene or Ice Age uh, occupation of the island Pacific. That was Indiana Jones on steroids, I can tell you. Finally, and crucially for this lecture, Jay taught me from day one that archaeology and heritage are two sides of the same coin. That's something I believe he got from my archaeological grandfather, Jesse Jennings at Utah, a.k.a. the Dark Lord. I'll return to him at the end. Sadly, we gather here at a time when archaeology everywhere needs attention. On the face of it, the discipline seems to be flourishing in most parts of the world with the ascent of the heritage management industry. A truly vast amount of archaeological work is undertaken every day right around the planet in the name of heritage preservation, employing a huge number of people trained at places like UQ driven both directly by development pressure and through trickle-down by factors such as the growth of the World Heritage List, we're now well over a thousand sites, uh, the influence of the World Bank's heritage and indigenous safeguards and other international factors, the future for archaeology as heritage looks bright. Indeed, it's largely responsible for archaeology surviving the looming decimation of social science at UWA. In fact, archaeology is being positioned there as a flagship program owing to its strength and heritage. It's also responsible for saving world-leading departments, or at least bits of them, such as Sheffield, that are otherwise being gutted in the UK. Yet, what is this supposed progress doing to archaeology as a research discipline in historical science? Our claims to scholarly authority and professional integrity are under ever-increasing scrutiny from planners and developers, descendants and locals, looters and collectors, and politicians and diplomats, very few of whom have any real understanding of or sympathy for the basics, much less the nuances, of our craft. This pressure is being felt everywhere. At Leiden, Europe's highest ranking centre for archaeology and in the global top ten, Many of my colleagues were outraged a few years ago when a key national report that will shape the future of research across the Netherlands for years to come didn't mention archaeology once, yet mentioned heritage numerous times. Even organisations such as National Geographic, which understands archaeology better than most, having supported us generally since they sponsored Hiram Bingham's expedition to Machu Picchu in 1911, recently began redistributing very significant amounts of funding to become, quote, more impactful in the cultural heritage preservation space as part of a major strategic realignment. So what should we do in such circumstances? Should we just carry on as usual and hope for the best, to keep calm and muddle through, as the Brits might say? Should we retreat into what one Australian anthropologist dismissed as our cave holes, trying to block out the noise while focusing on the esoteric technical work that's so often our forte? Alternatively, should we abandon any pretense at scientific rigour and fall for the dubious attractions of New Age spiritualism? Well, I've seen colleagues do all these things and more in different parts of the world, including Australia, and I don't agree with any of them. We certainly need to be politically savvy, strategically responsible to myriad circumstances, and open to a diversity of perspectives. 
At the same time, though, we need to embrace, value, and safeguard our own disciplinary heritage. So we have a clear vision of where we've come from and where that points us for the future. If we don't understand and appreciate our own history, how are we to convince others to value, or at least continue to pay for, what we do, rather than see it as an irrelevant waste of taxpayers' money, an impediment to progress, a colonialist imposition, or an instrument to advance or retard domestic and international political power plays? Can he be serious, I hear some of you ask? Isn't the history of our discipline littered with examples of knowing or inadvertent complicity in the excesses of nationalism and colonialism? Why would we want to embrace value and safeguard a heritage like that when it's exactly those sorts of issues which continue to dog us in many parts of the world? Shouldn't we make a clean break from our past and try to do things differently? In Australia, such matters are certainly up close and personal for us. Professional archaeology, begun here only in the 1960s, almost 200 years after initial European colonisation, uh, has for the last 40 years or so, and most of my professional life, been intimately wrapped up in really painful politics of ongoing nation building in a decolonising context. Now, I know many people in the audience have been entangled in these sorts of circumstances in other parts of the world. Marshall, for example, works in Hawaii long hotbed of First Nations activism on archaeology and heritage, as I found out when doing a World Heritage Assessment there some years back. The biologist with me was sure that the native Hawaiians were going to throw him overboard a big canoe that we were in just far enough offshore that he couldn't swim back to safety. Didn't happen. Yet as someone who's worked all over the world as well as all over Australia, I can say that Australians often see themselves and are frequently held by others to be more involved than most at the pointy end of post-colonial archaeology and heritage. We bathe in the light of Australia's Borough Charter, universally acknowledged as the gold standard for cultural heritage conservation policy and practice. We laud high flyers like Lynn Meskell, doyen of archaeological heritage, who unbeknownst to most actually started her archaeological career here at UQ, around the time I was a postdoc. And after Cambridge, Oxford, Columbia and Stanford, she now has two chairs in Pennsylvania and another at Cornell. Talk about overachieving, Lynn Meskell. We hail Rodney Harrison, I can remember him as a first year when I taught him in UWA. He's now Professor of Heritage Studies at the Institute of Archaeology at the University of College London and will probably be the Institute Director uh, before too much longer. We point to Laura Jane Smith, now back in Australia after years in the UK and wielding untold power in our field as the editor of the world's most influential heritage journal. There are lots of others. Nick Thomas at Cambridge, who actually started his, his career as an archaeology undergrad about the same time as me, but at ANU. Um, who else? We could probably even claim Chris Gosden at Oxford, Professor of Archaeology at Oxford these days. Although he's a Brit, he spent a long time in Australia uh, working with me in New Guinea, apart from anything else, but also uh, at ANU uh, in his own right and then at La Trobe for quite a long time. They're all quite famous people. Insiders in the heritage game also know of people like Neville Agnew, a one-time UQ researcher and head of conservation at the Queensland Museum, now a senior player at the Getty Conservation Institute in LA, leading major archaeological heritage conservation projects the world over. We're also aware of lots of Australian archaeologists pulling levers in the world heritage system over the decades, and we'll return to one important one of them later. And usually, and particularly from our Australian perspective, of course, our involvement is seen as positive. We're out there with our Indigenous partners, fearlessly changing the paradigm, and either being joined in that battle by similarly high-minded colleagues or dragging the less keen along for their own good. That's the nice version. The not-so-nice version is that Australians are disproportionately responsible for visiting a post-modern, post-colonial nightmare on the discipline. We're resented for eagerly prying open a Pandora's box of issues that archaeology as a scientific enterprise really shouldn't have to deal with, they say, most obviously in connection with heritage of Indigenous and other descendant communities. And in fact, I remember a seminar here at UQ in the Mickey Building when a highly esteemed British colleague, British colleague only half-jokingly blamed Australian archaeologists for restrictions on research in the UK at places such as Stonehenge. He was incensed at the ignominy of having to answer to government authorities about the impact of archaeological research on the cultural rights of modern druids claiming Indigenous interests in the site. 
across the Atlantic, Canadian Robert McGee's 2008 paper in American Antiquity explicitly implicated Australians in what he called Aboriginalism and the problems of Indigenous archaeology in North America. Much of the concern expressed by McGee and others of his uh, ilk linked uh, one way or another with the impact on research or scientific archaeology, in inverted commas, of questions of cultural heritage, most notably regarding Indigenous and other descendant identity claims. That's what so exercised my Leiden colleagues, for instance, in the wake of that government report I mentioned earlier. Partnership with Indigenous and other descendant communities on questions of heritage, McGee and his co, uh, or his, his uh, people who agree with him, disparagingly believe, sees as, quote, sharing theoretical authority in a way that will strip archaeology of the scientific attributes that make it a particularly powerful narrator of the past and accord it, at most, equal weight relative to oral tradition and religious discourse, which he obviously doesn't value very highly. Now, you may think this view expressed in 2008 was an outlier these days, but I've spent many years working in the Society for American Archaeology at the highest levels and other bodies around the world, and such perspectives are still surprisingly common across North America and in European and other professional circumstance, uh, circles, including UNESCO and its advisory bodies. Ironically, although some archaeological colleagues may lay the blame for the discipline's current travails at the feet of Australian heritage practitioners, Concern about the impact of post-colonial dynamics and the subversive role played by Australians is also voiced by sections of the international cultural heritage community. In print in 2009, and in person at the head of a, a, a delegation of like-minded colleagues at the 2011 ICOMOS General Assembly in Paris, the late Michael Petzett, then the leading uh, heritage figure in Germany, strongly asserted what he glossed as Australian approaches to community engagement uh, strongly asserted that they're fatally undermining the management of cultural heritage around the globe. To paraphrase him, the words community and archaeology, oh, sorry, community and people are not included in the title of ICOMOS, as you can see on the screen, the International Council on Monuments and Sites, one of the three independent statutory advisory bodies to UNESCO under the World Heritage Convention. He waved around his ICOMOS card, which is that's a copy of. Uh, and as you can see, it's got a winged pegasus on it and proclaimed, are we supposed to change it to a flying kangaroo? I won't go into what happened after that, but um, although he caustically criticised Petzett's views on this matter, even the late Willem Willems, who established my chair in his name in Leiden and who is Petzett's mortal enemy, regularly and emphatically reminded me that, Ian, this is not Australia when we're on a mission here or there around the world. In this context, I feel some responsibility as a person with a senior place in archaeology and heritage in Australia and globally to ask whether our discipline really has an Australian problem, as some people believe. Now, that requires a bit of history. If any single person can be held accountable for what I've called uh, in print recently, the Australian turn in archaeology and heritage at a global level, it's the late Peter Rucko. He was a Brit, but from 1972 to 80, he was the principal of the then Australian Institute of Aboriginal uh, Studies, now uh, the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, or IATSIS, or what insiders just call the Institute. And Wikipedia, that great font of unblemished knowledge, says, Ako was a controversial and diversive figure within archaeology whose life's work focused on eroding Western dominance by broadening archaeological participation to developing countries and indigenous communities. It also notes that he sought to involve indigenous Australians, hiring them in the Institute Council and its committees. In fact, two Aboriginal people, two Aboriginal people including Queensland's Senator Neville Bonner, Bonner from Ipswich, had in fact been appointed to the council just before Ako arrived. But Ako did greatly accelerate the trend. In 1976, right when Jay arrived, in fact, Ephraim Barney, who studied here as a, uh, when I was a student, was the first Torres Strait Islander appointed to the council. Uh, and that reflected Ako's insistence that both of Australia's Indigenous peoples be recognised, although, in fact, the Institute's name didn't change uh, formally to reflect that until 1989. Now, what Wikipedia doesn't say is that Ako's much-needed moves to indigenise the Institute 
were largely a response to the famous eagle, hawk and crow letter from a group of uh, Aboriginal elders and I think one white colleague uh, demanding such changes. Now, not long after he returned to the UK from Australia, ICO became the driving force but, excuse me, behind the creation of the World Archaeological Congress, or WAC. WAC was created in 1986 as a breakaway from the UNESCO-affiliated International Union of the Pre- and Proto-Historic Sciences, of which ICO was the UK secretary. And he started to rebel when the union refused to sanction scholars from South Africa during the time of anti-apartheid protests around the world, which I remember quite well in here in the AAA, the Australian Archaeological Association. And in addition to its routine professional duties concerning the exchange of results from archaeological research and the conservation of sites and so on, WAC is dedicated to, quote, professional training and public education for disadvantaged nations, groups and communities, and the empowerment and support of Indigenous groups and First Nations people. And WAC's one World Archaeology book series was central to establishing the scope and tone uh, of this endeavour. And early volumes featured such titles as Domination and Resistance, Who Needs the Past, Indigenous Values in Archaeology, Conflict of the Archaeology of Living Traditions, The Politics of the Past, and so on and on in that vein. Now, the ethos of these works became, and in the background, remain, uh, remains a touchstone for archaeologists and heritage practitioners operating in turbulent post-colonial waters. Influential as ACO and WAC have been, though, they didn't just appear out of thin air. Before WAC burst so dramatically onto the scene, pioneering Australian archaeologist Isabel McBride uh, published Who Owns the Past in 1985, bringing together papers presented in a conference she organised through the Australian Academy of Humanities in 1983. McBride's PhD was the first ever awarded on the basis of Australian Indigenous archaeological fieldwork, and she was a highly influential figure in the same milieu that sensitised ACO to the issues at stake. Since that time, the themes first addressed by McBride's volume have been continually revisited by scholars around the world, not just through WAC, but more generally. And to return to the idea of Australians with significant behind-the-scenes influence, McBride also had a profound impact on world heritage policy and practice, uh, and thus through trickle-down heritage practice at all levels all around the world, by forcing the recognition of First Nations interests in cultural landscapes and intangible heritage based on her forward-looking partnerships with Aboriginal people. As Swiss researcher Aurelie Gefeller put it, quote, McBride's concerns reflected the transformation of archaeology in the post-colonial context of Australia, uh, especially growing Indigenous political activism, which prompted the rise of what would be termed Indigenous archaeology, just what McGee was fearing, in which the discipline intersects with Indigenous values, knowledge, practices, ethics and sensibilities, and involves collaborative and community orientated or directed projects and rel related cultural perspectives in a nutshell. Now, one crucial result of the changes in the attitudes and approaches of archaeologists and heritage practitioners in this context has been the emergence of codes of professional ethics uh, focused on the decolonisation of the discipline. These codes all have their own histories, but often trace their ultimate origins to the developments in Australia, such as the resolutions concerning Aboriginal ownership of Aboriginal archaeological heritage passed at the 1982 annual conference of the Australian Archaeological Association. At that pivotal meeting, which I attended with Jay as a, when I was a research master student here, Tasmanian Aboriginal activist Ros Langford, I think Annie was probably there and a few other people, Richard maybe was there, uh, Ros Langford eloquently expressed her people's right to control and share their culture and history on their own terms. As detailed by Jim Allen, one of the protagonists in those and later events in Tasmania, and coincidentally my PhD supervisor at ANU, according to him, two salient motions at the time were, one, that this conference acknowledges Aboriginal ownership uh, of their heritage. Accordingly, this conference called on all archaeologists to obtain permission from the Aboriginal owners prior to any research or excavation by the archaeological profession. Uh, sorry research or excavation of Aboriginal sites, and three, that this acknowledgement of the debt owed to the Aboriginal people by the Australian archaeological profession, this conference calls on all archaeologists to actively support the Aboriginal land rights campaign through whatever means they have at their disposal. Now, as Alan remembers it, neither of these motions passed unanimously, but passed they did, signalling a groundbreaking shift in Australian archaeology and heritage practice fostered by First Nations intervention. In addition to prompting scholarly efforts such as McBride's volume and uh, conference on who owns, the past, who owns the Past, 
This shift saw the creation of the Australian Archaeological Association Code of Ethics. And the last of the four principles relating to Indigenous archaeology endorses and directs members to the IATSIS guidelines uh, for ethical research with Indigenous people. Now, this link explicitly highlights the overlap and other close ties between the membership of the AAA, the Archaeological Association, and that of the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island Studies, and indeed also indicates the personal influence of Peter Ucko on Australian archaeology when he was at the Institute and later. Now, these post-colonial upheavals in Australia were not restricted to the discipline of archaeology alone, nor, of course, to Australia as a nation. Even if the profession here has long been at the cutting, or some might say bleeding edge, of the global decolonisation process as it continues to unfold. As we're seeing, for example, with the repatriation issue continuing at Lake Mungo as we speak. And I've just lost my pace. In Australia today, as most of you will know, all research disciplines must comply with ethical requirements for clearance to work with Indigenous people with the IATSIS guidelines usually forming a central plank in institutional ethics frameworks with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island communities. Now, this sort of compliance is utterly familiar to colleagues in other Anglophone societies as well, but not so much in other parts of the world. In Leiden, for example, it just draws a blank. Globally, WAC adopted the Vermilion uh, Accord on Human Remains in 1989, where I think the accused Michael Aird was uh, present. Um, very much uh, younger days, uh, and its first code of ethics the following year. Now, unsurprisingly, given the formative role of Australian experience in the development of WAC and Peter Ucko's personal uh, position, the language and intent of WAC's code of ethics is very similar to Australian codes of ethics and guidelines. Around the world, however, other professional bodies and heritage organisations, as well as museums and their representative bodies, have developed guidelines, but interestingly, most of them don't really talk to working with descendant and Indigenous communities. Even though in many parts of the world, the archaeologists themselves are the Indigenous, so it's a complex issue. Interestingly, for example, despite or perhaps because of the long-term involvement of European archaeologists in what Canadian, or the late Canadian, Bruce Trigger called colonialist and imperialist archaeologies around the planet, the European Association of Archaeologists Code of Practice still contains almost nothing about working with communities, local, descendant, traditional, or any. And in fact, when I gave uh, the inaugural dean's lecture in archaeology at Leiden, I remember a, a very prominent ex-dean standing up and just saying, oh, we don't have to deal with local communities in the Netherlands. I was speechless. Luckily, other people piled on. So. But it's just, yeah, it draws a blank. And similarly, while UNESCO World Heritage Priorities Call now for or call rather for community consultation. Work by my Leiden colleague Monique van den Dijk shows that very few archaeological, uh, very few World Heritage operations, sorry, very few World Heritage nominations bother at all with the matter. Moreover, it was only in 2015 that the World Heritage Operational Guidelines, our bible when we're doing World Heritage work, were broadened to include mention of Indigenous interests, despite decades of intense criticism and lobbying on the issue from First Nations people around the world. Now, all this activism might seem quite radical in the long view of the discipline, but is it really? Has this intense focus on modern identity politics truly taken us off in a new and more ethical direction that substantively improves scholarly archaeology as well as its relationships with the communities amongst which it works? It would seem hard to doubt, but as many others have asked before, how different is it really from the discipline's involvement in nationalist and colonialist projects over the last few centuries? We might these days be helping give voice to oppressed Indigenous minorities or other local communities, but in doing so, aren't we still interpreting the archaeological past in terms of essentialised and highly problematic uh, ethnic and racial categories that archaeology can't actually underpin empirically? You cannot dig up an ethnic group. And in fact, archaeology quite often empirically undermines such uh, categories. The Celts, for example, are a great... Uh, a great um, term, is a great term to focus on. It flattens and diminishes the rich diversity and dynamic histories of the varied peoples to whom that label is attached. So too, in fact, with terms such as Aboriginal in Australia, as numbers of my First Nations friends and colleagues continue to point out. 
Even if it's in its simplest original Latin meaning of from the beginning, the word Aboriginal can imply that the descendants of Australia's first human occupants remained, as I think Pauline called it in 1920-something, unchanging people in an unchanging land for tens of thousands of years. Now, we know empirically as archaeologists that that's simply not true, just as we know that the Celts and many others are as they're quite commonly portrayed. Yet we continue to use these sorts of questionable categories uh, now and have done all the way since the modern discipline emerged. And how does continuing to do so in the context of modern identity politics improve things? I'm not suggesting that our attempts to work ethically with community stakeholders are doomed. Rather, on the basis of my long experience trying to develop workable ethical approaches to theory and practice, I'm suggesting that we look to the history of our discipline to see where our real strengths lie. And on that basis, think of how we can make use of those strengths in ways that benefit both the discipline as a scholarly endeavour, as well as other parties with interest in the past. Going back to the 19th century roots of modern scientific archaeology in Britain, and thus by extension Australia, we find that Sir John Lubbock spent a great deal of time bringing archaeology and heritage management together in mutually supportive ways. Lubbock was, amongst other things, a Member of Parliament, as well as President of the Royal Anthropological Institute of Great Britain and Ireland, and President of the Society of Antiquaries of London, of which numbers of us are fellows. In 1872, he began the very drawn-out process of establishing Britain's first Ancient Monuments Protection Act. Now, his interest in doing so was mainly to protect archaeological sites for archaeological research. But he also used it as an opportunity to demonstrate the value of archaeology as a scientific discipline and advance the cause for its support by the public and funding by government. As historian of archaeology Tim Murray put it, Lubbock's labours in connection with the first Ancient Monuments Protection Act show how, quote, the exigencies of preservation have been an important context for the building of archaeological theory and for the legitimation of claims of, to knowledge about the archaeological past. In other words, Lubbock understood as clearly in 1872 as our Swedish colleague Christian Christensen did in 2008, when he observed, Christensen observed, that, quote, heritage is the dominant organisational and legislative framework for all archaeological practice, and it's where most of the money is spent, unquote. Now, absolutely central to Lubbock's tactics was an understanding that the profession had to communicate effectively regarding the plausibility, reliability, and social value of archaeological findings with those who we would today call community stakeholders, which in his time, like now, meant lawmakers and land developers, as well as archaeologists and local communities and other people with interests in the past. Now, even this cursory dip into archaeology's modern history shows that far from the relationship between scientific or research archaeology and heritage management being some post, sorry, fashionable postmodern or post-colonial imposition from Australia or anywhere else, for that matter, it's been there as a mutually beneficial interdependence from the very start of our modern discipline. Now, that's something we should embrace, value, and safeguard, I think, as one of the discipline's foundation stones, as is Lubbock's emphasis on the necessity of effective stakeholder engagement to the success of this interdependence. The problem for us today, with Lubbock's work bringing archaeology and heritage together and engaging with stakeholders, and indeed the problem for us with archaeology in Lubbock's time more generally, is that it was closely aligned with nationalism and racialised theorising. As we all know, this sort of thinking was implicated archaeology in the devastation of global colonial, colonialism as well as the horrors of Nazism. It's little wonder that many colleagues around the world, including, I have to say, most of the older generation of Australian archaeologists, shrink back from the discipline's recent re-engagement with racialised identity politics and the simplistic and archaeologically unsupported essentialisms upon which they so often rest. Some, like the late John Mulvaney, who lived through World War II and was a giant in modern Australian archaeology from its inception, have written quite explicitly about their fears in this regard. And such concerns are looming large again now with the upswing in migrant and refugee movements around the world that we see on TV every night. So how are these concerns countered by archaeologists in the lead up to World War II, thinking about that period, when such matters were trending towards their tragic conclusion in the Nazi death camps? Another great archaeologist, Via Gordon Child, probably the most influential archaeologist of all time, was literally a child when Lubbock was at the height of his powers. Child was an Australian who studied archaeology at Oxford 
uh, after studying classics at Sydney. On return here, he was banned from working in academia because of his socialist activism. But he actually worked teaching Latin at Meriburgh Grammar, just up the road for a little while. He went back to the UK, though, and forged a momentous career there. He didn't realise that his first chair, the Abercrombie chair at the University of Edinburgh, was, like many chairs in those days, unpaid. And he had to struggle, like many people, and there was an old joke about a similar thing at Harvard, which I won't go into now. But uh, he went back, started to forge his momentous career, went on to become the uh, director of the Institute of Archaeology at UCL. OK, so he went back four digits of his career. Now, his interpretive frameworks had an enormous impact on European and, indeed, world archaeology for a long time, and in some quarters still do. And they would certainly have been influential when Mulvaney, McBride, Jim Allen, for that matter, uh, and other Australian and British-born founders of modern Australian archaeology were training in Britain after World War II. There's a reason why Australian archaeology used to be called Cambridge in the Bush, because that's where they all came from. So can we attribute any so-called Australian problem in today's community-oriented approaches to archaeology and heritage management to child, or in his deep influence on generations of scholars in Europe as well as the Antipodes? Well, not in any direct sense, I don't think. While Child was deeply involved in Australian Labor Party politics early in his life, there were no high-profile Indigenous identity politics of today's sort at that time, despite a degree of Aboriginal activism. In any case, Child was preoccupied with other issues when he was in Australia. In his work as an archaeologist, however, uh, 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 in addition to his work as an archaeologist, Child was not completely untainted by the racial theorising of, of his era, but he was a card-carrying Marxist who very strongly criticised Nazi, formula Nazi formulations of history and archaeology. In 1933, he wrote in the journal Antiquity that, quote, to admit as good only what is Celtic or Germanic or Indian as exclusive nationalism would demand is unscientific and unhistorical. On this basis, I think one can assume Child would not have endorsed the more strident identity politics underlying a good deal of recent theory and action in archaeology and heritage. Now, after he retired from the directorship of the UCL Institute of Archaeology in 1956, Child returned to Australia with the intention of ending his own life. Before jumping to his death off Govett's Leap in the Blue Mountains, near where he was raised, he expressed some interest in the research prospects of Australian archaeology, but publicly criticised academic racism towards Indigenous Australians. Now, there was no such thing as Australian archaeology in the modern sense then, so this activity at the very end of Child's life could not have directly affected the way Australian practitioners thought about Indigenous issues and archaeology or heritage. Yet there's a, a complication. It's highly likely that the influence of Child's leftist politics and vocal anti-Nazi stance through his 20 books and 200 papers on archaeology did have an impact on the first generation of Australian archaeologists in training. Indeed, the entry on Child in Australia's official National Dictionary of Biography was written by my PhD supervisor, Jim Allen. Along with Tim Murray, Jim Allen was a central player in Australia's most damaging conflict with Aborigines and archaeologists, the so-called Tasmanian Affair, largely because they pressed what might be characterised as a Childian line on the essentialism underpinning Aboriginal identity politics, dismissing exclusive Indigenous, well, in brackets, Indigenous nationalism as unscientific and ahistorical, to paraphrase Child. Now, others would value this kind of essentialism as strategic essentialism, but that's a discussion for another day. The difference between the approaches of child uh, sorry, and his intellectual heirs in Australia and elsewhere, and the sort of identity-oriented perspectives of researchers both in Lubbock's time and over the last few decades, is a classic example of how the discipline, along with other humanities and social sciences, of course, constantly vacillates between universalising and historicising perspectives, or Enlightenment rationalism and counter-Enlightenment romanticism. It would seem to me that both are necessary to understanding the human past in ways that not only deploy rigorously generated archaeological data in empirically supportable ways, but also make sense to the non-archaeological audiences who pay for archaeological research and, and heritage preservation through their tech, taxes and philanthropic grift, gifts. Thus, rather than dismiss either out of hand, we should understand that the history of the discipline demonstrates that both rationalism and romanticism are crucial. That we haven't cottoned on to this relatively simple message is borne out by Bruce Pascoe's recent great success in publicising a story that archaeologists have been trying but failing 
to convey convincingly to the public for at least the 50 plus years since Rhys Jones published his paper on fire stick farming. As I and various others have said a number of times before, we really need to get very much better at public communication. I'll return to this matter shortly. Another thing that we should take from our disciplinary history, whether looking only as far back as child or all the way back to Lubbock, is the absolute centrality of good archaeology in the technical scientific sense. Murray notes that when Lubbock was battling to have the Ancient Monuments Protection Bill passed, some opponents questioned whether archaeological knowledge was worth having. We've heard that before. Not, you know, not, it's not a distant thing. It's current now. Uh, but he notes that even so, the methodology of archaeology was never questioned especially its ability to produce rationally defensible knowledge about a past previously felt to be accessible only through speculation and the tyranny of hypothesis, i.e. guesswork. In other words, archaeological heritage preservation rests on doing good scientific archaeology. So we know that what it, oh, so we do it, so we know what we're preserving and why. So too with Gordon Child. In his 1933 attack on Nazism, he underlined the need for professional competence, asserting that the archaeological heritage so grievously abused by Hitler and his henchmen, quote, can no more be profitably studied without laborious scientific preparatory training, any more than can the movement of the stars or the behaviour of electrons. Interestingly in this connection, after having a difficult relationship with the profession for at least a generation, First Nations Australians have, are now increasingly coming to archaeologists to have, their technically, have technically competent professional archaeology undertaken on their lands. This has been happening here at UQ and elsewhere for some time. Uh, in southwest Victoria, for example, Gunditjmara people worked for years with archaeologists such as Ian McNibbon, another one of Jay's uh, prominent students. Uh, and, and in fact, a named target of Robert McGee's uh, 2008 spray in American antiquity. Um, and they worked with McNiven to recently see Budgebim in the Lake Conda area successfully nominated as a World Heritage Site. The first World Heritage Site anywhere in the world completely done by Indigenous people. Now, in some cases, Indigenous archaeologists, Indigenous Australians rather, are even asking for profoundly important sacred sites to be excavated, fully aware that what archaeologists find might not accord with their Indigenous perspectives. Again, McNiven's work comes to mind. His studies in Torres Strait over many years are a great example of this latter development. So too in other parts of the world, I have to say, where suspicion and hostility have been the norm for decades. In recent years in New Zealand, for instance, Marshall's friends and colleagues at Otago have been invited to, I always get these pronunciations wrong, uh, work at Wairau Bar or Te Pokohiwi, the earliest known human settlement in New Zealand and a place from which archaeologists were banned for over 50 years. Well, it's not just because the First Nations communities here or in New Zealand or anywhere else have suddenly seen the light of archaeology. It's in large part because archaeologists have worked really hard to communicate effectively with Indigenous communities, bringing archaeology and heritage together in ways that John Lubbock would certainly have understood very well, as would Child, for that matter. As Jim Allen wrote in the Australian Dictionary of Biography, Child was concerned with archaeology's relevance, and therefore his own, in contemporary society. One method he used to demonstrate his own utility was to write a series of books designed to present the results of his research in a non-academic form for the general public. The most popular were Man Makes Himself in 1936 and What Happened in History in 1942, which by 1957 had sold over 300,000 copies. I'd love it if one of mine sold like a hundredth of that number. But, you know. And his works have been translated into many, many uh, uh, languages and are all currently available uh, in print. Child, like Lubbock some 60 years earlier, clearly understood the need to bring people along with us on our journey of discovery. Which brings me to my conclusion. With continuing strong prompting from First Nations people, Australian archaeologists have made enormous strides over my professional lifetime in communicating effectively with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people about what we do and why we do it, to the mutual benefit, I think, of all concerned. In doing so, we've had a profound influence on professional practice around the world, even in places like North America, where they have their own indigenous politics, of course, and where similar post-colonial dynamics have also been unfolding. 
As my earlier quote from Christian Christensen underlines, this has all been done in a context where heritage is the dominant, or dominant organisational and legislative framework for our archaeological practice and where most of the money is spent. If you need further convincing of this crucial factor, think no further than the recent Duke and Gorge debacle in Western Australia. The material items that people are concerned about and the scientific evidence uh, of Dukin's great antiquity were all revealed by technical archaeology. However, the entire debate about the site's destruction has been couched in terms of heritage and heritage legislation, not archaeology per se. This is nothing new. The likes of John Mulvaney and Isabel McBride operated at this interface of Indigenous archaeology and heritage their entire career as did many other Australian archaeologists of their generation and since. Last page. Despite contemporary evidence such as this regarding Indigenous archaeology and heritage, as well as the historical lessons provided by the likes of Lubbock and Child, we've been much less effective in communicating our message to the other constituencies whose support, uh, whose support we also need to, concern, uh, to secure the discipline's future. We really have not demonstrated any understanding that the intimate intertwining of archaeology and heritage values that we take for granted in our work with Indigenous partners should also extend to every kind of field and laboratory archaeology in every part of the world if we continue to prosper as a scholarly enterprise and not get gutted as many departments in, in, uh, Europe, in the UK are currently being done, for example. Okay. In this connection, I coincidentally received an email the other day from a now retired but still highly influential friend who founded what became the largest heritage consultancy in North America. He actually sent me a picture of having a beer in Berlin. But you know. Echoing what I asserted at the beginning of his paper, he said that, quote, to someone who spent his entire career on the commercial side, it seems an odd time. Every heritage firm I know is hiring Yet my academic colleagues tell me that all their programs are under threat. In Australia, this hasn't yet quite come to pass, owing primarily to the political weight attached to the strong connection between archaeology and Indigenous heritage. At UWA, for example, as we're seeing right now, as I said. At a global whole of discipline level, though, the writing seems well and truly on the wall. As long as too many of our colleagues around the world her hesitate to incorporate heritage-oriented perspectives centrally in their professional approach, public support and funding for archaeology as a worthwhile field of scholarship will continue to decline. If the discipline still has a so-called Australian problem, it's not the one we started out with at the beginning of this talk. It's that we here seem to lead the world in community consultation with Indigenous people, have not taken our hard-won success in that sector to its logical conclusion, which is more effective communication with all stakeholders. And we need to communicate that work successfully, that broadening of our effort to our colleagues globally. By all reports, those colleagues are meeting with only mixed success in their efforts to encourage community engagement with the discipline. Though ironically, such efforts are often explicitly based on Australian indigenised practice. Like others in this room, I imagine I've had colleagues from the UK and other parts of, oh, well, UK's not in Europe anymore, Europe call me and say, the Scots are doing something with their heritage, what do I do? That's a potted version. They're not really, and we advise them on the basis of the, our experience here, but it doesn't always quite fit, and so it's not really as applicable as it might be. So we need to do more work here in Australia to expand our efforts to other sorts of stakeholders. So archaeology as a discipline, generating scholarly knowledge for its own sake, is far from a universally recognised public good. While heritage is demonstrably the framework in which non-archaeologists have pretty much always understood us and, crucially, have always paid for us. That's why we need to embrace, value and safeguard our own disciplinary heritage, going back to the likes of Child and, in fact, to Lubbock, and seamlessly integrate archaeology and heritage in all our thought and practice. As the Dark Lord Jess Jennings declared back in 1963, whoop, where is he? 
He, he used to always call me Ion for some reason. Ion, fix my slides. As he declared back in 1963 to express his ir irritation at the implication that heritage archaeology was somehow not real archaeology, and I've had this quote above my desk for decades, we do archaeology with a pure and problem or emergency and total, with the best skills, brains and rectitude we possess and continue to refine our knowledge of human history. Thank you. A little bit early. Stay right there. Hey? Stay right there. You can have this one. Well, thank you very much, Ian. Thank you for uh, presenting the whole lecture. And as a, as a token of our appreciation, we have this certificate of appreciation. <laughs> Congratulations. What a, what a lovely token. Yes. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And just, just before we wrap up, I have one advertisement uh, to, get, to, to do. Uh, the president of the Australian Archaeological Association, uh, Tina Mann, who's somewhere in the audience. Where is she? Thank you, Tina. Has asked me to advertise to all the archaeology students in the room, and I don't expect you to wave to me, uh, about the careers fair that's being held at the AAA conference. The, the Australian Archaeological Association 2021 uh, conference. So there's a careers fair for students. If you Google that, AAA 2021 um, student careers fair, it's on the 2nd of December online. It's your opportunity to meet with dozens and dozens of uh, potential employers. So uh, get in on that. To wrap it up, thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jay and Alice, for uh, making the trek down from the peninsula. And please, everybody, join us for uh, drinks and canapes in the foyer with Ian, with Jay, with Alice, with Richard and Tim, and with the Dean and Deputy Dean and the Head of School. Thank you all for coming. Uh, that's our hall lecture for 2021.